Chapter 10, Section 3. Was laissez-faire capitalism ever stable? Firstly, we must state that pure laissez-faire capitalist system has, well, not really existed. That means any evidence presented in this section can be dismissed by right libertarians for precisely this fact, as it, it was never pure enough. Of course, if they were consistent, you'd expect them to shun all historical and current examples of capitalism or activity within capitalism, but, you know, this they do not do. The logic is simple. If X is good, then it is permissible to use. If X is bad, the system is not pure enough. However, as right libertarians do use historical examples, so shall I. So, according to Murray Rothbard, there was a quasi-laissez-faire industrialization in the 19th century. The Ethics of Liberty, page 264, from the horse's mouth himself. So, I'll use this as an example of 19th century America, as this is usually taken as being the closest to pure laissez-faire capitalism, in order to see if laissez-faire capitalism is, well, stable or not. So, yes, I'm aware that 19th century USA was far from laissez-faire. There was a state, there was protectionism, government economic activity, and so on and so forth. But, as this example has often been used by right libertarians themselves, for example, see, not, see Ayn Rand even on this one, I think that we can gain a lot from looking at this imperfect approximation of pure capitalism. And, as was argued in, section, uh, in chapter 8, it is the quasi-aspects of the system that counted in industrialization. Not the laissez-faire ones. So, was 19th century America stable? <laughs> uh, no, it, no, it definitely was not. <laughs> Firstly, throughout that century, there was a continual economic boom and slump cycle. The last third of the 19th century, often considered as a heyday of private enterprise, was a period of profound instability and anxiety. Between 1867 uh, and 1900, there were eight complete business cycles. So boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, okay? Eight complete business cycles between 67 and 1900. Over these 396 months, the economy expanded during 199 months and contracted during 197 months. Hardly a sign of great stability. Since the end of World War II, only about a fifth of the time has been spent in periods of recession or depression by way of comparison. Overall, the economy went into a slump, panic, or crisis in 1807, 1817, 1828, 1834, 1837, 1854, 1857, 1873, 1882, and 1893. In addition, 1903 and 1907 were also crisis years. <laughs> Part of this instability came from the eras of the banking system. Lack of a central banking system, writes, uh, uh, writes Richard Duboff, until the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 made financial panics worse and business cycle swings even more severe. It's the accumulation of power page 177. This was in response to the instability that the Federal Reserve System was created, and as Doug Henwood notes, the campaign for a more rational system of money and credit was not a movement of Wall Street versus industry or regional finance, but a broad movement of elite bankers and the managers of the new corporations, as well as academics and business journalists. The emergence of the Fed was the culmination of attempts to define a standard of value that began in the 1890s with the emergence of a modern professionally managed corporation owned, not by its managers, but, to, by, uh, but by dispersed public shareholders. See Wall Street, page 93. Indeed, the Bank of England was often forced to act as lender of last resort to the U.S., which had no central bank. In the decentralized banking system of the 19th century, during panics, thousands of banks would begin to hoard resources, so starving the system for liquidity precisely at the moment it was mostly needed. The creation of trusts was one way in which capitalists tried to manage the system's instabilities, at the expense of consumers, of course, and the corporation was a response to the outlawing of the trusts. By internalizing lots of the competitive system's gaps, by bringing more transactions within the same institutional walls, corporations greatly stabilized the economy. Now, all during the heyday of laissez-faire. We also find popular protests against the money system used, namely specie, in particular gold, which was considered as a hindrance to economic activity and expansion, as well as being a tool for the rich. 
The individualist anarchists, for example, considered the money monopoly, which included the use of specie as money, as the means by which capitalists ensured the laborers are kept in the condition of wage laborers and reduced to the conditions of servants and subject to all extortions as their employers may choose to practice upon them. Indeed, they became the mere tools and machines in the hands of their employers. With the end of this monopoly, the amount of money capable of being furnished would assure that all would be, no, uh, would be under no necessity to act as servant or to sell his or her labor to others. Lysander Spooner, a letter to Grover Cleveland, page 47, page 39, page 50, and page 41 out of that letter. In other words, a specie-based system, as desired by many so-called anarcho-capitalists, was, ki- was considered a key way of maintaining wage labor, and exploitation. Interestingly, since the end of the gold era of the gold standard and so commodity money, popular debate, protest, and concern about money has, well, largely actually disappeared. The debate and protest was in response to the effects of commodity money on the economy, with many people correctly viewing the seriously restrictive monetary regime of the time responsible for the economic problems and crises as well as increasing inequalities. Instead, radicals across the political spectrum urged a more flexible regime, one that did not cause wage slavery and crisis by reducing the amount of money in circulation when it could be used to expand production and reduce the impact of slumps. Needless to say, the Federal Reserve System in the USA was far from the institution these populists wanted. After all, it's run for and by the elite interests who desire its creation. That the laissez-faire system was so volatile and panic-ridden suggests that so-called anarcho-capitalist dreams of well, privatizing everything, including banking, and everything will be fine are very, well, let's say, (laughs) naively optimistic at best. And ironically, it was members of the capitalist class who actually led the movement towards state-managed capitalism in the name of sound money.